I would like to welcome everybody to the first on-air broadcast of a chapter event. Um, before we get to the, the presentation, I'd like to take a minute to talk to you about membership in the IEEE Computer Society. To those of you who are already members on behalf of the Society, I would like to thank you and remind you that if you have not already renewed, to do so by the end of December. For those of us, those people joining us who are not members, I highly recommend visiting computer.org to see the membership options available to you. All members have access to great content from Computer Magazine, conference events, webinars, Computing Edge, chapter membership, and member pricing to the digital library. Depending on the membership option you choose, you could also have access to complimentary downloads on the Computer Society Digital Library and skills wow. on our, our online training platform. Sign up today and become a part of a community of 60,000 technology professionals in 168 countries. Thank you. And here is Barish to uh, introduce our presentation for today. Awesome. Hi everyone. So I'm very happy to see all of you here. So thanks for all the people on, online and coming here. Uh, we are very happy today uh, to host uh, one of our triple distinguished speakers, Dave West. So he is the CEO of the Scrum. So I'm now giving the stage to him. Well, thank you again for coming. Okay. Well, hi everybody. I'm just going to switch um, the uh, the actual slides on. Let, um, let me know if you can actually see them. Um, hopefully, you can see these at uh, at home. Thanks for uh, thanks for welcoming me. Um, it's a bit odd to be sort of both presenting to people in a room and trying to also present uh, remotely. Um, Kind of a weird thing, but we'll see if we can make it work. And uh, so I apologise if you, my head suddenly disappears at home, or if uh, or if I completely forget about you and disappear over into the corner and start having a conversation. But I'll do my best to uh, to remember that. So um, right, make, make yourself at home. So my name is Dave West. Uh, I'm Quaver, the co-creator of Scrum, is um, is my boss. So you can think about that. I'm the product owner of, for Scrum, and my boss is the guy that invented it. So you can imagine what that's like. Um, he has some very strong opinions on the future of Scrum and, and the like. Um, people that don't know what Scrum is or um, haven't had the experience around it, it's about 22 years old now. And so one of the premium agile methods in the world, I guess, it's probably the most important one. You guys at Oracle are big proponents of Scrum and, and use it, most organizations do. About 12 million people use Scrum every day, 12 to 15 million people I say, are using Scrum. And um, we'll talk a little bit about Scrum and about why it's so popular as we go through the presentation. Um, but as you can tell from my <laughs> accent, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I'd like to think this is the original accent from Boston, but uh, we'll disagree. And recently, I have to apologize, I, I decided, because when you became an American citizen, they said my teeth weren't good enough to be American. Uh, so I recently had Invisalign, so I apologize if I, sometimes you can't necessarily understand me. It's awful, but my wife says it's for the best. I'm not totally sure I agree with her, but uh, and I know what's going to happen next time I go to England, they won't let me in because my teeth are good. <laughs> I'm sorry, you can't be British, your teeth are good. Anyway, so we'll see. Now, um, as we go through the slides, uh, as you, I have a ridiculous accent. If I say anything you don't understand or you disagree with, please feel free to, you know, it's a very small group. Um, we can Feel free to, you know, just say, "Hey, what about this?" We can discuss, we can have a conversation, because that's ultimately what we're, uh, what we're, uh, what we're in the business of. Uh, I'm going to be talking about something called Nexus. Um, I'm going to be talking about something called Scaling Scrum. I'm going to be talking about how you can apply agility at, at scale. And the reason why the title is "It's Turtles All the Way Down" 
is what we observe is very similar to that <laughs> old story, you know, the classic turban story when uh, a child is talking to his um, or her grandfather and uh, and she says, what's, you know, what's, what's the world on? And he goes, it's on the back of a turtle. Okay. She goes, oh, great. And then he says, so what's the turtle on? And uh, the grandfather returns to her and says, it's turtles all the way down. And ultimately, when we look at agility and we look at the ability to sort of respond to an environment in an agile way, sometimes we, with our own desire to engineer, particularly as we're all, a lot of us are engineers, is we forget the essence of agility and the focus on empiricism and things. And we build organizations that forget about the individual <coughs> because ultimately the way to scale agile is to use empiricism to scale agile. It's a complex problem, large groups of people focus on the similar endeavor. So it's important that we don't think, oh well, let's use a classical waterfall plan approach to scale agile. So that's the reason why it's called turtles all the way down. But we'll we'll see if it makes sense as we as we go through. So I'm gonna you're gonna see my belly frequently as I uh, as I go to uh, uh, I'd like to say six pack, but unfortunately um, unfortunately it's not. Okay, so interesting fact about Scrum and Scrum.org. Ken and Jeff, when they created Scrum, 22, well, actually about 30 years ago, some of you weren't even born. Um, I'm just being generous. <laughs> anyway, the, um, it was not developed to build a methodology. And that, uh, I was actually, when I first met Ken Schwaber, I was the uh, product owner, <laughs> product manager of something called the Rational Unified Process. Go you a mouth. And um, yeah. Yeah, yes, that's uh, a one fan. Yeah. Uh, so you and Mal and the Rational Unified Process, I was the product manager for it. And I met Ken in a, in a conference, and he told me I was an idiot, uh, which I now realize was totally true. Uh, and we argued greatly. And I was a methodologist. Well, conceptually, I was a software engineer that had been forced to be a methodologist, I guess, or a software developer that had been forced to be a methodologist. Now, interestingly, when you look at Scrum and you look at the ideas about it, it isn't, it's not about Scrum. Scrum doesn't matter. It's not a religion. It's not a, uh, it's not a, 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 a tribal thing. It's not joining a club. It's all about delivering stuff to customers better. Now, the reason why we need to use things like Scrum to do that is because as much as we think, if we spend enough time thinking, we can solve every problem and therefore just do it in a very efficient and proper way because we like that idea. The reality is not that. The reality is that complex problems require an empirical approach or a scientific method approach, and that means that we have to respond in an environmental way. Now, so ultimately, don't worry about Scrum. Worry about learning what the heck your customer work, want in the most minimal way possible. Now, we would argue that Scrum will provide you a framework to start that process, but ultimately you'll build things on top of that to make it work. And about scaling, we'll talk more about that. So, um, <laughs> so there's me wearing exactly the same shirt, which is very embarrassing, and I don't know why I keep doing this, but uh, you know, when you take a photo, it's my favourite shirt. So, um, my contact details, my Twitter handle, all that kind of stuff. Feel free to reach out to me. I love this stuff. This stuff's very important to me. Hence the reason why I drive all the way up north and get the nosebleeds and everything to come here. Um, because Route 3 has turned into this parking lot. I don't know what, what happened. Who's, why are they all coming? Where are they going? I don't know. Are they all going skiing? Anyway, but the, um, so what I'm going to talk about, we're talking about, you know, scaling, Scrum, how you scale it successfully. It's about Nexus, it's a fabulous book coming out on the 15th of December. Maybe written by myself and a few of us around Nexus, uh, brilliant stocking filler or um, a holiday gift. Um, <laughs> Secret Santa, you could not do wrong with it, I'm just saying. Um, Nexus framework and then talk a little bit about, you know, uh, generally about the, the framework. Um, okay, some data, always interesting. Uh, so about 12 million people are doing Scrum every day. Uh, IDC data. Uh, about 90% of Agile teams are doing Scrum and probably and some and lots of other things as well. It's practiced everywhere. So we, our website gets about 4 million people to it every year. A little bit over that. And what's interesting is where they're from. 
uh, whether it's Iraq, whether it's uh, 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 Antarctica, yeah, <laughs> whether it's um, South America, India, uh, whether it's Russia, everywhere around the world, everybody's doing that, which is, which is kind of interesting because it started in Burlington, Mass. It's kind of cool to be part of something. New England, you know, go Patriots and all that. Um, uh, they're a football team, well, American football team, uh, and some people that are online. And yes, I know it's called football, and no, only one person uses their foot, but, you know, uh, I mean, it's only as confusing as the World Series where only America and Canada plays. But, uh, anyway, anyway, uh, 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 anyway, so, so, uh, so 1.8 million people taking the open assessment, uh, 145 professional scrum masters in the world, and Almost 100,000 people have been taught by our community of 200 trainers, uh, which is turned into three trainers. It's just interesting, just the size and scope of Scrum. Um, and just to remind you, when we're talking about all of this stuff, and one thing that if you, if you leave this thinking about one thing, we have a propensity or just often a, a style that when we uh, approach a complex <laughs> problem, we try to build an com incredibly complex solution. The essence of empiricism and lean thinking, which is ultimately what Scrum is, self-organized teams, empowered teams, working in an empirical way. When we scale Scrum, we need to think in that way. When we scale Agile, because often we don't, and we end up unempowering un our teams and not actually delivering frequently and getting learning, and we build an entire system around this. When we, when we talk about scaling, we often mean two things. We often mean scaling more people doing software <laughs> delivery, delivering in a, in a sort of agile approach, as it were. Um, more teams, different project types, different, maybe they're, you know, maybe they're building networking software, maybe they're building new databases, maybe we're scaling out, doing more products in a, or more software systems in an agile way. And then the other thing that's really very interesting, and maybe you've had some experience of this, which is um, agile growing outside of just developing software, moving into marketing, into finance, into portfolio planning, into, into the business itself. Obviously, it's a very famous um, uh, CEO that recently got fired, so it can't be that good, Jeff Emmelt of GE who took these ideas in, the, in something, a framework called Lean Startup, which is sort of agile plus a business sort of canvas kind of model, and said, let's use that on my business. And um, in things like the, the jet engine part of GE, which I don't know is going to exist soon, which is shocking, um, that, the, that they now, you subscribe to a jet engine. They, they give you the engine, they can charge you for the data. You know, it's that kind of, they've fundamentally changed the way they think about their business because what they've done is deliver empirically. Another interesting story is a Saab. And yeah, they, they make, now they don't make plane, uh, cars, they make planes. And the best, supposedly the best fighter aircraft in the world today is a Saab fighter aircraft, as reviewed by Aviation Magazine. I don't know how you review a fighter aircraft, I'm sure there's all sorts of fabulous tests. I'm sure it's like, is this, does a stereo work, all that. But there's probably you know, reasons for, you know. <coughs> interestingly, they have scrum teams. They have to be using scrum, but that's sort of irrelevant. But they have small teams working on the plane, continuously innovating, um, compared to a very famous American fighter plane, which was developed by committee, and has cost US taxpayers billions maybe trillions of dollars ultimately. <laughs> Very different approach, um, which, is, which is interesting. Another interesting thing is the Ghana police force. So uh, Africa is very, um, it's challenging to live in certain parts of Africa, put it that way. There's a lot of corruption, there's a lot of tribal um, things. Um, we've recently been involved in a, an initiative inside Ghana, driven by the, strangely, the president of Ghana, which somehow we got introduced to in a very strange way, and uh, about delivering scrum to the Ghana police force to increase transparency, to respond, adapt to the environment, to, um, and our training classes, actually the guys had Kalashnikov rifles in the training class, so a whole having an argument about something was definitely not 
high up on our agenda then. <laughs> <laughs> As you can imagine, you know, sorry. No, you really need to approach. No, actually, you can do whatever you like. But uh, anyway, so the point is that what we're seeing is a lot of organizations now are trying to apply Agile in many different contexts. They're trying to broaden its reach outside. And, and ultimately, you know, that, that's great. And I love it. However, I'm not totally sure how it works. I'll be honest. I, I don't know. And I think every situation is going to be slightly different. That's the nature of the, the application. So when we're talking about scaling today, oh, maybe we're not. Oh, yeah. What we're trying to talk about really is really that scaling products, scaling multiple teams working in an agile way, allowing multiple teams to work together in an effective way. That's why I'm focused. I, yes, you could apply it to your marketing department. Good luck. Um, uh, for many reasons, <laughs> uh, but good luck. If you want to do Agile HR, that's cool. If you want to do, that's great. That's not what I'm talking about today. Now, we could talk about it, and I'd love to have conversations with you about it, but that isn't really the focus of what I'm going to be talking about. What I'm assuming is that you're already in an organization delivering working software. Maybe you're like Oracle, where you deliver a lot of fabulous working software every day. And that's kind of working, or kind of not, you could argue either way. But ultimately, you've got multiple teams working together on a single endeavor. Maybe they're delivering a new database, maybe they're delivering a new uh, upgrade to a database, whatever. They're working together. That's what I'm going to be really focused on, because I think that's really important. And, um, and, and that's what we have a lot of experience. And the reason why, interestingly, is because what we've found over and over again is that when organizations try to scale agile, they're looking at how to get multiple scrum teams to work together. This is a survey that um, uh, version one, um, formerly a separate company now, just been bought by uh, Collabnet, um, sort of merged. Um, the, the, when, we, when we see teams, it's the most popular way of trying to scale, trying to get multiple scrum teams to work together. So, so that's what I'm going to be talking about. And uh, that will hopefully make some sense, or not. Um, Okay, let's talk about, let's start at the very beginning. Let's start really simply. Let's talk about one scrum team. So, what we've observed millions of times now, well, maybe thousands of times, or certainly more than one time, um, are they survive in spite of the environment around them, if they're successful. The environment around them is this incredible, complicated merge, you know, collection of stuff. You know, there's processes, release management and portfolio planning and timesheets and all this stuff, you form a scrum team and a good scrum team sort of like just puts its head down and just gets on with it. They're very similar to when you have a production problem at work, you know? You know like when, you, when RP150 goes down and you're like, oh my God, it's gone down. How are we going to do the end of month run? And you get a group of people and ignoring all of the existing systems and environment around them, they survive. And really, they follow a very, very simple, very, very simple process. You know, they get and put the work into some sort of ordered structure, call that a product backlog. They then sit around in a meeting, plan it, and decide what the highest priority is, what's the most important stuff, hopefully being driven by some sort of business person, call that a product owner. That then forms into a, this is what we're going to focus on first. Um, in this time frame that we call a sprint, but in this small group of time. They then work on it, meeting at least daily, inspection and adaption. It's a daily scrum, it's not a daily, it's not a stand-up. Very important. Yeah. And the re reason why it's very important, the reason why I think this word, is, the phrase is very, very important, and so it's a slight aside from the scaling story, um, is for two reasons. One, some people can't stand up, for whatever reason. Maybe they're disabled, maybe they're lazy, maybe maybe whatever reason. So we shouldn't have something that is like only people that can stand up and do it. So, but then the other reason, a more important reason is, the reason why it's called a daily scrum is because it's a scrum. Now, some of you may have played rugby in your past. Maybe some of the ladies in here. Uh, the American ladies team is much better than the American men's team, so I can say that. So rugby is a sport played by real men, we don't wear pads. And, um, and it does happen to have a very large amount of drinking associated with it. 
for that. But if you just smack the crap out of yourself, the last thing you want to do is stay sober, just for the record. Anyway, so a uh, scrum is formed. Do we know when a scrum happens in a rugby match? Well, when some minor infringement has happened or the ball has got stuck, usually under somebody else, somebody that's been buried into the ground by a large guy with a beard. And you're laying there on the ground, the ball's under you, and nobody can get it. And, you, and so what you do is you form a scrub. So they pick you up, usually dust you off, bind your, your gum shield, um, which is usually covered in muck. Um, you put it in your mouth and you go, oh, that's horrible. And then you do a scrum. Now a scrum basically is whoever had the ball has the put in. And the scrum forms two hookers, um, um, uh, two props, a hooker on two sides, and then uh, second row, and then loose forwards. Uh, and then you push <laughs> forward when, and you, you make a decision. You basically get the ball comes out, the game starts again. That's exactly what it is in a project, in a team. You are kind of, you're not necessarily stuck, but you want to be going forward again. You want to be making progress. So you form and you say, hang on. How's everybody doing? What's, you know, what's stopping us? Let's inspect and adapt. Let's raise the transparency. So by calling it a daily scrum, you remind yourself over and over again that that's why you're here. You're not here to do status reporting. You're not here to stand up and say, are we all happy? Do you need a hug? You're not here, though you can. That's, you know, I'd recommend it. Hugging is good. You know, not enough hugging in the world, isn't it? Um, you know, so it's all, it's basically, how do we get better? How do we, you know, what, why, let's get, move the game again. Let's get it going. That's why it's a good day to go. Anyway, slide aside, now back to the real story. But, um, so, meet daily, da -da -da, sprint review, at the end of that sprint period of time, now interesting, another myth about Scrum um, is that you only release it after the sprint review. You can release whenever you want. It's irrelevant. With the release process is completely different. Ideally, a sprint review is on production software. That's, that's the best sprint review. Basically, a sprint review is it's a planning cadence. A sprint is a planning cadence, not a release cadence. So that means that sprint review, you, you invite a bunch of stakeholders, they're geezers you want an opinion from, virtual or physical, for the people on <coughs> virtual, and then you say, hey, what's the situation? You know, what do we like these? You know, let's get some data from production software or from some tests or whatever. Let's see that maybe do a demo of the, you know, whatever it is. And you get feedback so that you can then plan again. Then you do some feedback around how the team's working. That's the <laughs> retrospective. And then you feed that back into the sprint planning and you start again. The sprint length is determined by how often you can get these geezers and how much volatility you have in your planning horizon. If it's more unknowns, you shorten the sprint. If it's less unknowns, you could learn from the sprint. That's okay. <coughs> or what you tend to do is what 90% of teams do today, you make it two weeks. <laughs> Which I actually really big back. You get that regular cadence and all good in life. Anyway. Slight little refresher on Scrum, sorry, didn't mean to get sidetracked on that, but it's important. So we've got these single teams working in spite of everything, and they do well. Why? Because you've got great people in the team, because you're using, you know, you've, you've tended to pick the best people to do that first Scrum team, and everything's going well. So what do you do? You do what everybody does. <laughs> you throw loads of people and loads of Scrum teams at it. Yeah. And it all goes a bit horribly wrong. <clears throat> Everybody starts treading on each other. You know, you, you're like, oh, well, I want to work on this. Oh, no, but you're working on this. How many product owners have we got? Hang on, do, why do, we, do we do, all do a daily stand up at the same time? The room can't deal with that. We, some of these people are remote, some of these people are over here. It starts getting messy. It's like an ink block. You start stepping on each other's code, maybe. You start stepping on some other things. And, you know, Hard to get a shared goal. Multiple teams working together. Coordinating teams. Fred Brooks taught us, didn't he? And the mythical man mum. That the, the only way that software does not obey the laws of physics. If, um, if, a, if one software developer took a week to build something, if two software developers <coughs> will probably take two weeks. 
<laughs> it's not halving it. It's ridiculous, but it's true. It does not obey the laws of physics. So coordinating multiple people, multiple teams starts getting very complex. It's very hard to allow some of the very important concepts of Agile to happen. Self-organization. Well, if we allow self-organization, they might not organize in a way that allows them to work together. So I'm going to say, you guys do user interface, you guys do mid-tier, you guys, you look smart, you do the data, because that's the important <coughs> All right. And you do some network. <coughs> the, uh, bring it all together. And then, so then, oh my gosh, how's that going to happen? So you have to get them project managers, and, and they then start fighting. It gets really complicated. And there's dependencies. Hang on, this team's dependent on that team, but that team's dependent on that team. Hmm. What do we do? How do we solve that? It's very challenging. And getting harder. And most organizations, when this happens after a very successful one scrum team working, start going back to old ways of working. Because they're like, well, the real world, and they use this phrase often, the real world means we can, you know, it was perfect when there was one team and that's all that we're worried about. Now we've got multiple teams because obviously the way to deliver lots of software is to put loads of people on it. Okay, a little aside here as well. How many people do you think are on, in the, on the SpaceX software development organization, in the engineering organization that delivers SpaceX? So the guys, they write everything from launching it, docking with space stations or delivering satellites and what they do in space, and then landing it. And because Elon, because those guys are insane, Elon Musk, etc., they land it on a boat in the middle of the ocean. No like spatial easy, let's put it on, land it on a blooming big runway that's twice the size of England. Let's actually try to land it standing up like one of those science fiction movies on How many software engineers? 30? 20? Oh, you're cheating because you because of what I said earlier. 34. 34. Now, they're probably quite smart geezers. <coughs> but interestingly, I don't know. Yeah, so I met the guy that was the head of engineering. He was speaking to the conference. I was speaking to him. Very interesting. Not the best presenter. But the what was interesting is they're like, so you always hire rocket scientists. He goes, oh, no, they're all. And he goes, uh, the problem with those guys is they're too, they can't work together. They're, they're awful. They're very good if you put them in a room working out something. But they're really bad, you know, classic mit -isms. You know, you bring them out and you introduce them to friends and it all goes horribly wrong. Um, I, I'm sure there's lots of MIT people that aren't like that. But anyway, so, but the point is, come broadcasting. Damn, that's good. <laughs> okay, ignore that. That was a complete, look, <laughs> MIT's awesome. So, you know. Well, yes, yeah, awesome. Anyway, um, but the point is, it's very, very interesting. It's a very interesting uh, that it's a small team of not, you know, they're awesome people and they work well together, and et cetera, et cetera. 30, 40 <coughs> scale. So, but most organizations, though, they ignore that and they have thousands of people wanting to build software in many different geographical locations. Usually, you know, in India and in and, and, uh, Eastern Europe now, and, and then they say, why is this not working? So, one of the biggest challenges, really, is uh, about dependencies. One of the biggest challenges is managing dependencies. And there's two essential characteristics of any scaling approach. And actually, any approach in general, really, that's of, of scale. And it, it tends to focus on two things. Anticipation. So identifying and minimizing or resolving dependencies up front. So some would call that planning. <laughs> and then rarification. Rarification being making something real. Uh, some would call that integration. Um, when we built Nexus, or when the guys built Nexus, not me, um, they, were, they used long words, anticipation and rarification. But planning and integration are the two key things. So I like to think um, I'm a big proponent of trunk-based development. I don't know if you guys do trunk-based development. Branches are evil. Simple as that. Do not branch your code, ever. It's the devil's work. Well, maybe not the devil's work, but it's very naughty and very challenging. So basically, if you're doing continuous integration, and if you're using products like GitHub or Git, they would encourage you probably to do branching, and then they use very sophisticated mechanisms to merge. 
instead of doing that, how about everybody just merged in the same branch, development branch, continuous? Now you're going to say, oh, we can't do that. That's really hard. Yeah, it's really hard. But it's a bit like, um, you know, eating your vegetables first. You know, you actually, it's not like I've got to pour in a half year old and a two year old and getting them to eat anything green. But if you make them do it first and then give them a nice cream afterwards, you're more like to. You, the bottom line is you have to focus on those problems early when it's small, and then they're much easier to fix. That's our experience. But anyway, so integration and planning. Identify and resolve when my spend is up front. Make sure that you're continuously planning those dependencies. Make them very transparent, very visible, and then continuously deliver integrated software or integrated product over and over again. And that means testing it continuously. It means model driven deployment. It means automation. It means keeping your debt to a minimum to ensure that it actually does fit together. Those two things are crucial for any scaling approach. And you're like thinking, you know, you're like, yeah, so of course that's true. But actually, often we forget that. We forget that to minimize dependencies requires two things. It requires us to continuously reintegrate to highlight those issues and then be continuously planning to make sure that we keep an eye on all those issues when they're highlighted. Now, okay, so Nexus. So about three and a half years ago, um, I, was, uh, I was running a, a startup uh, called Carstock. And we just got 12 and a half million, no, yeah, 12, 11. We just got a bunch of money. And uh, I was, and Ken was my mentor, Ken Schwaber was my mentor. So I'd meet him once every six weeks, eight weeks, and we'd talk about stuff. And so what's the first thing that you do when you get VC money? Well, you have a really good party. That's the first thing you should always do. We have a lots of kegs. And then you build a new website. Always do that. And then you go, oh my god, we've got, a, we've got this plan that we promised. Let's start building engineering teams out. Let's start increasing our engineering, our sales and marketing, all these, you know. Let's start adding more people to the company. Um, which is exactly what we did. So I was talking to Ken about this. I was like, okay, how do you do that? He's like, I said, Scrum doesn't help you. He goes, don't be stupid. Of course Scrum will help you. I, they couldn't, I'm a very expensive consultant. No small project could ever afford me. I only worked in large environments. And I'm paraphrasing, obviously, say like that. But ultimately, all of the projects that he worked on, Sentinel, FBI Sentinel, great, famous project, where you know it was multiple people working in the, for the FBI and trying to resolve the dependencies there, um, have always been large. Scrum works, he says. Just, just empower your teams, get good Scrum masters, everything's going to be good. He goes, but maybe we need to provide a little bit more guidance. So uh, Scrum.org and a bunch of people started trying to distill the best practices that large Scrum implementations were doing. And instantly decided not to focus on how they were doing planning, because that was really, everything was different, and not about sales and marketing and all that stuff, but focused on really how do the teams work together. And that, those ideas have been sort of brought together in something called the Nexus, that's what it is. And the reason why it's such a bad name is because Google has a phone called the Nexus. Um, there was a, a uh, there was the Matrix, uh, which obviously the Nexus was the thing that the Matrix was in, and and was it all a dream? And anyway, um, uh, interesting. And so the bottom line is it's a rubbish name, but I didn't choose it. But the reason why Ken and and the team chose this was because it's a relationship or connection between people or things. The idea that there's something that unifies a group of people together to deliver something, to, to work together, it's this thing. And um, really what Nexus is in the context of Scrum and scaling, excuse me, is an exoskeleton. And because I, like anybody that works in our industry, love science fiction and the like, um, this is Sigourney Weaver. Um, interesting, very hard to find a nice picture of this. 
Um, Sigourney Weaver is fighting an alien. Some of you remember that. Um, it's scary. We've all woken up in the morning and had to do this. Um, and uh, she puts on an exoskeleton. Interestingly, because of the, um, the, 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 the increase in computing power and all this stuff, exoskeletons are starting to become the reality. Um, it's funny, augmented you know, physical, because power is getting so easy to, it's kind of cool. So maybe one day, you, instead of when you walk by a building site, you see a bunch of things rolling around, you'll see a bunch of people running around, which would be really cool. Again, not really relevant to what we're talking about. But anyway, so think of the next, think of Nexus, not as anything new. Think of it instead as really just an exoskeleton, a few extra things that we would concentrate on when we're doing Scrum, when you've got multiple teams. That means you can apply it in the context of any process that you're using at that sort of macro level, whether it's safe, whether it's less, whether it's disciplined, agile, development, add, or whether it's your own thing, it doesn't matter. If you've got multiple teams working together, Think about using Nexus, because it would help you work that way. And this is what it is. It's really simple. I was going to bring up some posters, but then I totally forgot. So uh, this is a Nexus. Um, a few things that are worth talking about. I'll quickly do that, and then there's some slides that talk about it as well that will just add to my confusion, or your confusion probably. So there's a few things that are different to Scrum. I mean, it looks very similar. Oh, hang on, can I do that? In no, I'm not going to dare do that. Oh, yeah, I can. Um, it looks very similar to Scrum. Look at that. But it's a little different. Let me talk about what's the difference. So first thing, refinement is a first-class citizen in Nexus. You're going to say, why is that not in Scrum? And by the way, when I talk about Scrum, I'm talking about the Scrum guide. I'm talking about Scrum. I'm not talking about you know, Fred's implementation of Scrum. I'm talking about the core ideas of Scrum. So I'm sure Fred's doing a fabulous job. So refinement is not in the Scrum Guide. Now, it, it mentions it in passing, says you probably should think about doing it, but it doesn't make it a mandatory activity. Primarily because we try to build a framework, or Ken and Jeff built a framework, which is amazing, but it's so, it's, it's just enough to get going with building software in an empirical way. It's not everything that you need. Some organizations will need refinement. Some organ if you've only got like a daily sprint, then you're not going to need refinement. If you've got a weekly sprint, maybe you don't need it then as well. Refinement used to be called grooming. Also, that has some really bad connotations, particularly in Europe. So um, it's really going to get together as a team and whoever else you need, but for the team, and looking at your backlog and getting ready for planning next time. You know, it's that refining your backlog and your understanding based experience. When you're working in a scaled environment, you have to meet and do refinement over and over again because anticipation is a key way of avoiding dependencies or managing dependencies. So you continually have a look at the backlog, look at all what you've learned, say, hey, are our assumptions still true? And you do that on a regular basis. So refinement happens frequently. And it's a mandatory thing in this. Everything else is pretty straightforward. You know, um, you know next to sprint planning, it's just you do some planning as a whole nexus, and then you break into the teams to do planning. Most organizations do that. Uh, what we observed over and over, very similar. <coughs> so have a nexus sprint backlog. Oh, hang on, this is an important point. Only one backlog. You've got multiple teams. But are working together. Do not give them separate backlogs. Why would you? It's like having like two project plans. <laughs> you know, it's like having multiple. Everybody's got their own project plan. Let's get the project together. How's that going to work? Have one backlog, and then, you know what that means. Then one product owner, only one person that can decide the priorities of the work that you're doing. One backlog, one product owner. This need to sort of like have multiple product owners, multiple backlogs, and then somehow magically get them all to knit together, just don't. It's just overkill. And it doesn't work. One backlog, one product backlog, one spring backlog. 
Um, usual stuff there. Oh, I'll try that in a second. Um, there is something I'm going to come to in a second, which is kind of different. Uh, Nexus Daily Scrum, guess what? You get your team, you get your Nexus, to get, so a representative of multiple teams. This might be called a Scrum of Scrums, if you want to call it that. They meet 15 minutes a day. And basically, how are we moving forward? They usually spend a lot of time talking about impediments between teams or, or making things transparent across teams. Um, don't make it your scrum master that does it. Allow the teams to self-select who goes to that because ultimately get people, if somebody's got an integration issue or some sort of fundamental issue that's cross team, get that person to go rather than having somebody communicating between two, you know, simple. Daily scrums, no surprise there. They so happen at the team level. Next is sprint review. That's another very, very important thing. And actually, that's something that we did at TaskTop that's really, really important. That even though we have five scrum teams running at any one moment, that we brought everybody together to do a review of everything that was integrated and, you know, and that's what the next is. And, and then that goes about the same. The Nexus integration team is the one thing that people might find interesting. We talk to a lot of organizations. We have this training community of you know, 203, 204 trainers, and they're all working with clients every day. And so we talked to, to a lot of different companies. And we found that there was a pattern, and this really just describes this pattern. Most organizations had a group of people that met regularly, as needed really, that worried about integration, that worried about getting the thing to work together, that worried about making sure that the integrate the the, the the main was working if you're using uh, trunk-based development, using Git or whatever, and spent a lot of time worrying about that, and then fed back that no collective knowledge into the teams to fix things, maybe build automation frameworks, maybe um, fix certain process issues with Jira or whatever you're working with. But Maybe um, look at deployment models and automation around that. Whatever those things work to fix that. So we, again, not a very good name, a knit, but we created this, um, this role. It's a bit like a scrum master, but it's populated by multiple people. So it's a bit freaky. Um, this role called the Nexus Integration Team. And that, that, that group of people, um, and could include people outside the Nexus as well. This is everything that's kind of freaky about this. We never do this in Scrum normally. But there might be somebody from security, because integration requires us to have security. Our definition of done included something around security. It might have somebody from operations, because deployment is such an important part. It's whoever you need to make sure that you're integrating and creating potentially shippable product every all the time. Um, anyway. And then everything else, I think, is pretty straightforward. Does that make sense? People that are doing Scrum, it's not alien, right? It's kind of like, like English and American, almost the same, but not. Um, <laughs> and that can be sometimes the biggest challenge. Hello. So, the refinement. Interesting. Um, big arguments. Uh, I'll tell you what I do. Sorry, a bit of a in this line of crisis now. Um, what I do is, if we're running a two-week uh, two sprint, we do refinement one week, sprint planning the next week. We do refinement one week, sprint planning the next week. So I do it that kind of frequency. However, in some situations, you might want to refine every other day if it's a really volatile, messy environment. Um, it really depends. The uh, Nexus guide, uh, of course, we have to create a guide to accompany this. Uh, doesn't specify. It says do it as frequently as you want, and it's decided by the teams. Uh, but most situations, if you do it more than once a week, it gets a little bit of a bad, a bit of an overhead. Does that make sense? I know. How does everybody else? So you're doing Scrum, or you're using Scrum, or you're thinking about Scrum. How often do you do refinement? Do you do refinement? You may call it grooming. I don't mind. Um, do you? Uh, my experience with Scrum is usually people say it in their, they use it in their namesake and then they just stop dealing with it. Oh, yeah, we have a lot of that. Yeah. yeah. Yes, <laughs> tell us, say, don't you call it a standard. Um, 
yeah, there's probably some. Uh, it, there is definitely the uh, Cinderella effect, whatever it is called. What's that? Uh, a lot of yeah, there are a lot of organisations saying they're doing Scrum that aren't really doing Scrum. And I've had other um, groups where we actually did really try Scrum. So the current group I'm in right now, they it's just every day they have a meeting. Um, and then there's no like overall planning um, and all that other stuff. But uh, I had another project where we were yeah. actually using some, yeah. and um, one of the problems that we faced was because we had so many meetings because every two weeks you'll have to have the backlog. Well, that sounds cool. Awesome. The Santa, right? The management, which was more used to having a waterfall method, just and couldn't understand or justify why we were having so many meetings. Okay, so that's my experience. I love I love management. I, I, I so I love that perspective. Um, I, uh, I only heard something called uh, less project enterprise um, by Craig Larman and, and Baz, and, and I love Baz. And Craig's even worse, but Baz says it. He goes, well, that's the reason why we need to fire them all. And then he talks about management. I love the fact that people seem to think that there's a huge overhead with Scrum. But like, oh my God, we meet 15 minutes a day? How long are you in the bathroom every day, mate? <laughs> well, how long does it take you to go? I mean, how many times do you go to the cop? So you're telling me that you don't want to invest to bring the team together every day? Well, sounds like an overhead. Won't people just be off doing their thing? And you can specify exactly what the whole project's going to be from that spec at the start. Well. Obviously, we've done it thousands of times. Have you done it thousands of times before? And it's just ironic that how many of those projects are late? Well, quite a lot of them are. How many have got production and defects? Oh, well, but that's the fault of the people. But you don't allow the people to meet. It just seems to be counterintuitive. Saying that, though, on the other side, there is a legitimate criticism of Scrum because there's a lot of people that have made quite a lot of money out of Scrum. I'll be honest. As I drive up in my Honda Accord, my 2007 Honda Accord, you'll realize that's not necessarily me. But the, a lot of people, it's a great car. It smells a bit, but it's important. Anyway, the, the law seat. Um, the, the, there is a criticism, and it's a very fair criticism, that there's a bunch of people that are teaching people Scrum that don't necessarily, they aren't necessarily great at it. And because of that, what they do is they, Sort of like, oh yeah, we're going to have a happiness fact, you know, like that's what we're going to do on a day, we're going to hug, we're going to get a team song, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Which you can imagine as a manager or as a leader, you're like, what the hell is going on here? So there's a fair criticism. However, the, uh, the, the overhead of planning frequently, the overhead of meeting frequently, is all about raising transparency, allowing us to inspect and adapt. And that is incredibly valuable. And I think if most managers saw that and saw the value of it, I think they would allow it to happen. But it, it is an interesting perspective. Well, I think one, uh, um, one problem one problem is is that you know you, you have to uh, for Scrum to really work and to not have that those meetings become huge overheads that people have to understand what's appropriate to talk about in Scrum and what's not. So you have the Scrum, from my understanding, like the daily. Uh, it's daily scrums is what did you do yesterday? What are you going to do today? And are there any impediments? And a lot of times people will like forgo those and they'll have a whole dialogue and then try to solve the problem as you're standing there in there. So there is a lot of that like people who don't understand the framework or don't necessarily buy in do actually cause a lot of time in these meetings. Totally get that. That's why scrum masters are such an important part. And it's much mismission aligned and much misunderstood. Having somebody that oils, that makes it work, that gets the, it's like teaching you to dance, you know? And it's making the movements, they're helping you do them, they're taking you through it, and then you're like, oh my God, I'm doing a tango. That's awesome. You know, and you're like, oh, wow, this is brilliant. Great scrum masters, hard to find. And the ones that are really good are incredibly valuable. But then somebody says, so what, what do they do? And that's when it gets a little challenging. <laughs> and you have to give these big lists of things that people are like, Wah. yeah. So I hear you. That's, that's really cool. Thanks for your feedback. <laughs> I love it. Comments and comments. 
Okay. So, um, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So, if we just quickly look at the, you know, the different things I talked about most of these, I'm not going to bore you with them again. This just sort of reinforces them. Oh, there was something I missed. Dash. I want to talk. Oh, hang on. Can I do this? Yes, I can. Sorry, people online. You're going to see my belly. Um, actually, on my top half. Uh, there's one other important point. Three to nine teams. So. Here's an interesting piece of data. We talked to lots of organizations. Spotify is a great example, though they don't call it Scrum. They're doing something similar to Scrum. And all of these organizations came back with a similar kind of piece of data. That when, 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 when endeavors were more than 100 people, it stopped working. And you know, and I say 100, 120 could have been fine, 110. It depends on the people, depends on the endeavor. But, but generally, at a certain point, to quote one of my favorite Scotsmen, Scotty from the Star Trek, you cannot change the laws of physics. The overhead of managing and coordinating multiple teams of people on a single pursuit or as a single endeavor, a single integrated piece of software becomes almost impossible to manage. The overhead starts over getting in the way of actually any value being added. We found that over and over again. Now, does that mean it's impossible? Maybe not. But the normal distribution would indicate that this is the best size is between three and nine teams. Below three, they can work it out. Above nine, good luck. I've got no idea. So what happens when you've got multiple, when you, when you need something to do like that? Frankly, I would say don't. But if you have to, then there need to be separate nexuses. You need to use good architectural principles to focus. Uh, low, uh, high cohesion, low coupling, you need good interfaces, you need to decouple them, you need to basically turn them into separate things and then very clearly manage that integration between those things. Remove those dependencies, get it completely apart. So that might mean creating a platform that the teams use, but not expecting that platform to be in total harmony and synchronization with those teams. That would be a huge overhead that will probably never happen. Instead, maybe think of it more as an open source type endeavor where you're creating, you know, defined interfaces, those interfaces provide. And it's interesting because this does work at scale with multiple nexuses working together, but it only works when you've got that kind of decoupling. That's what, that's what we've observed. That might be just because we're stupid, or it might be, I don't know, but that's what we've seen. You can't apply, if you have a thousand people, ugh, I don't know what's going to work, from my experience. So, yes, the, the output of the integration mm, I mean, it feels to me like a lot of it would be defining interfaces. What do you define interfaces? Some of it is, yeah. Some of it's so. So the integration team is this role. That's, actually, let's go to it. We've got a. We, I think we have a slide on it. Maybe not. Hopefully. Uh, you know, I've said that. Said that. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Provide the front accountability for the Nexus integration. So if you believe Baz and, and Craig from the less guys, they say this is, this is a mistake. This isn't Scrum. This isn't Agile. Because suddenly you've taken away a key responsibility of the teams and given, put it somewhere else. Big mistake. And part of me thinks, yeah, maybe it is. Because so to answer your, uh, this is going to be a long way of answering your question. And I, <laughs> when should I finish? Have we got to finish online and we can carry on the questions? <coughs> we have four minutes, but we can go like one more than 20 minutes or something. Okay, so for 10, I don't need that, but maybe 10. <coughs> okay, and then we can also talk about this offline. So, so, the, so they would say, Craig and Baz, and super smart, scrummy type people, would say, hang on a minute, the interfaces, when you need an interface, the team should <coughs> decide they need that and then negotiate with the other teams, job done. Just empower the teams to make decisions. <laughs> Our experience over and over again was, yeah, it doesn't work. It didn't work. So this might be a flaw, you could argue, that we've accepted. Yeah, maybe that's true. But you're right. They spend a lot of time thinking about automation. They spend a lot of time thinking. And remember that, that many of the people in this team are from those teams. The best net, net nets don't actually 
doing encoding themselves in that context. What they do instead is coach other people to resolve those integrations. And this is more like a, do I call it a book club or a, or a, it's a bunch of moaners as we used to go. They, they meet, they have a cup of coffee, they're like, bloody hell. Why, why, what the heck's happened with Maine? Why, why have we not had an integration in two days? Why do all these tests keep failing? Why, you know, those sort of things. Yeah. Well, it was ever since we started doing this. Bob's team, what happened to you, Bob? Well, you see, we're trying to solve this, you know, we're refactoring this huge element of the architecture, there's some data structure that we're refactoring, and because of that, it's kind of broken everything. Oh. How can we deal with this? Well, how about you guys do this? Or, this is the other interesting thing, maybe we reform, we restructure around this architecture. So the other thing about a nexus that I haven't really highlighted is, and this is really interesting as well, we saw this, it kind of broke the rules around teams a bit. At every sprint planning session, they, re, they potentially could restructure the scrum team. And they allowed that to happen. Now, did it happen frequently? No. But it could. Instead of what tends to happen today is the team is like this, don't break the team. And so because of that, you're like, well, how are we going to do this when it sort of crosses two teams and experiences? And they'd say, okay, let's build another team. Let's take those people out, put them in a separate team, and that's fine. Never done. But anyway, so um, you're right, they do it in, uh, spend a lot of time talking about interfaces, talk a lot about automation, talk a lot about test data, talk a lot about, and then they go back and make that happen in the teams. And um, who's in it? So it's, it's kind of like, the, you, know, it's a, it's, you know, it's a role, you tend to have, you have to have a product owner there. The reason why, or certainly involved, the reason why you have a product owner there is because some of the decisions they're going to make will have an impact on the priority, the, the uh, observable priority of those of, the, of that backlog. Scrum Master facilitates it, makes it flow. We talked about that, and then of course people that are uh, doing it, as it were. Uh, da -da. These are some of the uh, some more details about it. So there's consultants, coaches. Sometimes, sometimes this is. You know. So I actually am not a big fan of that. So my experience, uh, this is just a general sort of sort of rule of thumb. If you don't let your best developer code, you will be more successful in the long run. Now, you're gonna say, that's a crazy idea, Dave. If you measure them by the success of the team and you make them responsible for pairing with other team members, not only do you ultimately share that knowledge, teach it's like your best fisherman should never fish. You, know? <laughs> you should teach other people to fish. You scale them rapidly. Now, this is sort of counter-American culture. And I don't mean to be, I love America. America's my home, and I really do, I love this country. My kids are American, and my wife's American, and my underpants are American. <laughs> actually, they're Canadian, actually, but that's just a Zulu <laughs> anyway, but Anyway, um, <coughs> recommend them. Particularly if you're flying. Um, I do a lot of that. Anyway, so I love America, but there's a one chat thing about America that knowledge is power. You're promoted because I <clears throat> you're not going to fire him. He knows about, oh, who else is going to get RP150 to work? Right? You can't fire him, so you protect him. You look at him, and you call it my precious. And you, <laughs> and you, and you know what happens. Now, but all, all joking aside, knowledge needs to be shared, and you need to facilitate that. So the first thing that I always do is, if I've got a rock star developer, I do, I take off their admin ad right, rights to committing to me. I stop them from committing code to me, so they can no longer. Doesn't mean they can't write code, but they can't put it back into into the stream. Get code in. Work it out. <laughs> and then work with others. Anyway, crazy idea. But, uh, and this is a bit like net. I try not to encourage people to do stuff if I can avoid it. I want everybody to be doing stuff, not one person. Now, maybe this isn't to affect your organization. Maybe you have not got these situations, <laughs> but that's just my experience. And maybe I'm not a very good manager, so I couldn't get them to work with others and still contribute. 
But um, I never, yeah, I'm not a particularly good manager. Anyway, yeah, okay, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Oh, here's talk about refinement. Talk about refinement here quickly. Um, continuous elaboration, that's a fabulous name. We should use that over and over again. Um, very, oh yeah, some tips about refinement. It can be a never-ending story of complexity because, you know, new things have been added to the backlog, you're discussing stuff, you bring it up. Time box it. Now, time boxes are maximum. You don't have to always fill them. And by the way, that's true of the event. Just because you have a sprint planning meeting, if it's over really quickly, great. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's 15 minutes. It's not a mandatory 15 minutes for a daily. Um, but it is a maximum. So then we added that. Do you see the scrum guide? We updated the scrum guide on the 7th uh, of November. And uh, one of the things we added was to remind people of that because people kept forgetting. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, talk with the S so SMEs from outside the development team can be involved, managers can be discovered. I mean, I mean, basically, continuously do refinement. Here's an example of, of um, cross team refinement. Uh, there's a series of practices uh, on our website, you can look at these, of how you get visibility across dependencies when you do a refinement. Um, there's some cool games, um, serious games, they used to be called, I don't know what they're called now. Kind of rename them, but those uh, you know for mechanisms of this, um, whether it's some sort of planning poker, whether it's dependency poker, I don't know those sort of things. Um, trust your scrum master. So what else? Uh, scrum planning, you know about. I'm not going to bore you with this. Um, retrospectives are important, uh, particularly. It's very notice. There's two like cross cross team retrospectives. So what we tend to do this, we do this three kind of model. You know, let's get a few, let's get the whole team together and talk about what can be improved. Let's go away and break and talk about how we as teams work, and then let's feedback anything that we learn so that we can collectively improve. Uh, Kaizen, uh, so so Jeff Sutherland, awesome dude, used to be a fighter pilot. Interesting. Sorry. Um, he loves lean. Big fan, obviously. Uh, I mean, he, you know, he's written lots about it. He, he's, a, he's a great dude. So Kaizen, this sort of like improving. So if you think of sprint review being about getting feedback on the product, the thing you're building, this is about how you work. So having that opportunity to do that Kaizen to bring everybody together, like how do we get better? And I, and now in the in the Scrum Guide, and maybe you don't like this. I'm a little nervous of it. You have to bring something out of this that is then improved in your next sprint. And, and, and it's a good practice. Always try to find something to get better. It might be something as simple as, I don't know, um, something as simple as uh, we, we, need, um, we need the fridge to be moved because it's taking us like two hours to go and get milk every day. Or well, it could be something as big as like, we really need to introduce an, uh, an automation framework to do deployment. That's a pretty big one. You probably want to break that down, but anyway. Just an idea. Anyway, you know, whatever those things are, just bring them out. Make sure you do something with them. If you're not getting better, you're probably getting worse. <coughs> That's just the reality. It's so easy to fall into a, yeah, okay. You know, it's like they say at the gym, right? You can see all big gym rats. Um, in the, you know, they say you should not do the same exercises over and over again. If you do, you won't get any better. You just, you, your body cheats instantly. And human beings are massive to do that. Anyway, probably a survival thing. I don't know. Anyway, so this is this kind of like do it, do it as a group, do it as your team, do it as a group. Kind of fun. Um, okay, so finally, and I'm conscious of time. I'm sorry, I've overstayed my work a little bit, um, which is understandable. So you can scale. As long as you focus on dependent dependencies undermine cross the, the scaling <laughs> dependencies get in the way of of love and happiness. They they just destroy Scrum. They destroy agility. Being dependent on something, having an external dependency, gets in the way of agility. So create and inspect integrated increments regularly, refine regularly on mass 
Spend time as a group. I know your managers are going to think it's a little bit of an overhead. But if you want people to work together effectively, you have to bring them together regularly. It works. Even though sometimes you think, why are we doing this again? We all know what we're doing. And then somebody goes, oh, somebody says something. And all of a sudden, somebody goes, I thought we all, no, hang on a minute. No, we're doing this. I'm not. I'm doing this. No, 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 no. Getting people together is incredibly important. And ultimately, that's what Nexus does. And that's what Scrum does at the team. Nexus does it at the cross-team level. Um, <coughs> so, oh dear, that's a horrible word. That was actually coined by an Englishman. Uh, don't scale flaccid Scrum. So, um, so Martin Fowler, who you, some of you may know, awesome, amazing guy, continuous integration guy, uh, he said that, one of the biggest challenges of Scrum is that most people are doing it in a classic way, and I think you described a classic Scrum way. Really. It's sort of like they're sort of doing a daily, but they're not really doing planning because that's a bit of an overhead, and they're not really doing sprint reviews, and it's crap. If you got crap Scrum, do whatever you want, mate, but you ain't going to scale it effectively. <laughs> it's about your team. <laughs> if your teams are going with Scrum and they're just having some issues working with other teams, then Nexus would be great. And it provides you some great stuff. Uh, refinement's not optional. Bottom-up intelligence, don't, it's turtles all the way down. You know, don't forget that it's all about teams. And there's no magical godlike being that manages all these teams and makes sure they integrate and everything's fabulous. That does not happen. Well, it might happen, but then <coughs> you're lucky. Because my experience is it doesn't happen. So you have to harvest all that bottom-up intelligence. Um, be rigorous removing dependencies, be rigorous integrating frequently, and ultimately it's just Scrum at the heart of it, really. Um, some stuff, if you want to go and look at this Nexus guide, which we're in the process of ref uh, refactoring, <coughs> and um, oh, a fabulous book, if you like 2001 in Space Odyssey, you may see some Similarities there. How? Anyway, there's a fabulous book called The Next Framework of Scaling Scrub coming out uh, in, um, on uh, December the 15th. I don't mind if you don't read it as long as you buy it. <laughs> uh, the, uh, <laughs> and that is what I wanted to talk about. Is that interesting? It's probably really boring. Oh, uh, well, thank you. I appreciate that feedback. Um, yeah. If you don't think that, just don't say it. Because <laughs> um, uh, we like inspection and action through transparency, but not in talks. Yeah. Software, yeah. Talks, no. Any um, comments, questions? So let's take questions here first, and then we'll go to Cherry, and then you can tell us questions from online. Okay, so I, um, I'll, I'll, I'll finish this so I can actually see him. He's probably gone to sleep because it was so boring. But. Um, but, uh, oh no, look at him. He's like, it looks like Max Headroom. Uh, who probably nobody knows who Max Headroom is. So. Anyway, um, yeah, any, any questions or comments? No, it's all right, you can ask me about anything you want. Um, okay, Pop so one, one thing that I remember <laughs> um, experiencing is that you, so every year you're doing a scrum, right? And you have like these sticky notes and everything. And you have <laughs> they are totally optional. The they are okay. Well, um, so you have like these action items, right? That you need to. So you've got some sort of most people week, tend right? to have a board, right? But you have to complete them before the week, and if not, you're supposed to like I guess throw throw it away, and then you start anew. Okay, so maybe there's something I'll talk to you afterwards about that because that was one thing that I was like, this seems really odd. That would be really odd. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> Basically, okay, so just a quick word it about... It's like as if the work didn't really matter if you don't complete it and you can't, because they have points, right? So you have all these points that if you tally want. up. Oh, if you want. So, so if, then we had these situations where we'd get work 90% done, but we couldn't get credit for doing it because it was well, 100% done. That's right, Okay. but... I'll say, but... So ultimately, a lot of people think that velocity is why we do scrap. And velocity is a measure of productivity or efficiency or whatever you want to call it. So the idea is that through sprint planning, you estimate how big your PBIs, product backlog items are. You give them points, story points usually. Or you could give them anything, but story points. And then 
your velocity is determined by how many story points during the sprint, the time block, you deliver. And you monitor that velocity, you have something called a burn down, which demonstrates that velocity over time, right? That, that, that you know, you, you're literally knocking off the points, and, or you can have a burn up as well, depending on how you orient the graph, it doesn't really matter. And a lot of people think that's a key part of Scrub. It's not. It's a practice that a lot of organizations do. For good reason. It, it really does help you feel like you're making progress, you, you're burning down points. But it suddenly becomes a great thing that management <coughs> does because they're like, hang on a minute, your velocity is dropped. You're rubbish, obviously. Awful. You said you were going to do 100 story points this spring, you've only done 70 story points. Also, a very important concept of Scrum is done is done. Software engineers are a bit like Eskimos. Software engineers <coughs> have as many definitions of done as Eskimos have for stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you can say to a software engineer, is it done? They say, yeah, it's done. You say, oh, I'm going to release to production. Oh, no. It's not done done. It's probably done. It's probably done. What, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> well, it compiles and I've done some <laughs> tests. No, 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 no. That's not done. That is, you know. So that's the reason why you have a very important artifact within Scrum called the definition of done. That determines when you can say you're done on points. Now, so imagine a situation where you have a story or a PBI, a product backlog item, that is 100 points, uh, that is, God, that's a big story, that is 10 points. Most people use points as an idolized that man, uh, person, day of it. Anyway, Mike Cohen, anyway, anyway. <laughs> Um, anyway, so you end up with this, um, so say it's 10 points, and, and your definition of done is really done, like potentially should be. And then a dependency comes in that means that you can't sh make it potential, you can't finish the testing on it. Yeah. Let's just make that. Yeah, I'm sure that happens exactly. all the time. That is exactly it. So you're like, ugh. <clears throat> and so you say, well, you throw that away. Well, no, you don't. Actually, what tends to happen, what happens, and there's a lot of debate in the industry on this, by the way, I'm going to share with you my perspective on it. So you have now got something that you thought was 10 story points. You have delivered 90% of it, but you haven't managed to get it done in the spread. Letter of the law is then that should not be, you can't count it. But that's good that you can't count it. Why? <clears throat> because at the retrospective, well, one, it's not going to be in the sprint review because you're only demonstrating stuff that's done. So your stakeholders are going to go, well, you're being crap this sprint, aren't you? So that's embarrassing. So when you come to retrospective, you say, why wasn't that done? Why, are, why is our velocity 10 points less than it should be? That hopefully identifies an impediment or a series of impediments. You have a choice. You could recast definition of done. So you could cut the suit to suit the clock. Is, is that the expression that we eat now? Probably? But you can you say, okay, well, releasing software here is far too hard. Let's pretend that we don't. And let's <coughs> recast the definition of done so we can claim credit next time. The next, or we can actually fix that problem. How do we deal with this dependency? Hey, well, I know a guy. Or how about we just do this or whatever. And hopefully you've been doing that every day anyway on the daily scrum. But if you haven't, this is another opportunity to do now, and so something comes out of it, and, you, and that provides you with what we describe as collateral, uh, evidence, um, material. Uh, it's like, meet your honor. The, the, the accused was trying to deliver software, and he couldn't because he couldn't deliver, you know, because of the testing. I propose the following, and then the, 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 the jury and the judge will say, oh, yeah, we'll spend some time the next sprint fixing that. Because now you've got some evidence. That's a very useful thing. Now, you said, now the question is, what happens to that blooming story? It's now back in the product backlog, assuming that it's still important. It then goes through the usual, you know, assuming it was still the most important thing, it might not be now. You may have decided that actually we're going to push that down. So two things happen, and this is where the debate comes. Say it pops back into the priority list and it comes into the sprint next spring. What happens to all the work? Well, it hasn't disappeared. You've still got a partially. So what I do. I actually still estimate it, not at the recast. Well, this is the choice. You either re-estimate it, so it's only the bit that's left. So suddenly now it's a one story point. I'm just making that up. Or leave the estimate of what it was before 
and then your velocity goes whoa so you get a reward for it now you know we are chimpanzees at the end of the day so you know you give them a, give them a carrot they're very happy you give them chocolate and they love you forever <laughs> and um, just don't like, oh chocolate banana <laughs> minions <laughs> and chimpanzees uh, actually get that feedback and you like now they're excited like great we resolved it we actually got it done it helped our velocity massively so we're super brilliant this sprint because we're awesome and then you get a lot more traction fixing that it's a very long answer to a very short question but does that make sense yes yes it does cool thank you hello um so i you're thinking about only working in trunk and not branching I hadn't really thought about that before, and it seems scary. But it's in, really scary and horribly painful. Yeah, that's it. So in your all the best things are, right? Sorry? All the best things are. <laughs> in your example where the story doesn't make it through, but the people have committed to Trump, so now you're backing things out and doing reverse merges? Yeah. That sounds... It's even more painful. Is, it, is that really better than just creating a feature branch and merging the feature branch in when it works? That, that's actually really interesting. I was actually just writing a blog sitting in the cafeteria downstairs today. We need to call it... So, continuous integration, continuous development, Jez's work. Now people talk about lean UX as sort of like continuous instrumentation, so continuously monitoring and the like. I actually think we need to have continuous removal. If you're gonna be able to implement stuff, you should be able to bring it out. If you always should think about being able to remove software as much as bring it in. So Amazon releases every, how many seconds? So they, they release every 180 seconds, 120 seconds? Anyway, they, they release very frequently. It's kind of that thing they always put up whenever they do a presentation. One of the reasons why they can release so frequently and not be scared shitless, sorry to, sorry to swear, uh, on, online, is because they know if something stops working, they can switch it off and something else will take over. They have built organically robust software most of the time. It doesn't always work. Everything, everything goes wrong once in a while. The humans involved. Soon that will be not the case, but um, um, long live the singularity. <laughs> uh, the, um, but ultimately, they build software they can bring out. Now, so you've just highlighted a real challenge to doing trunk-based development. What happens when you commit it to main, you then get into integration, realize you can't integrate it properly, so you can't say that store is finished. So you've got a choice. Leave it in. Yeah, could leave it in. Or ideally, switch that toggle off, have, leave the code in, but have it not affecting the functionality of the software. But why not just create a feature branch and, and you can do your integration testing with merges, but not commit it yet into your... Because, that, so, sometimes that's fine. Working really well, then that's brilliant. But what tends to happen is, hang on a minute, I need another branch. Oh, hang on, I'm gonna put some stuff here. Oh, I'm gonna work in this. Oh, it works on mine, why are you not? What you find is there's a proliferation of chaos. Everybody polishes their, so, and I was writing this in the blog, and I'll see if it works. Um, when I was a software engineer, I used to write something called C++, which some of you may have heard of. Um, C++, uh, and now, I worked with some really smart people. I wasn't super smart. I'm nowhere near as smart as these super smart people. So integration with them was literally like being abused horribly <laughs> for at least a couple of days. There was one guy that used to, at lunch, do The Guardian. The Guardian is a newspaper, a very liberal sort of newspaper in the UK. Well, we're all really liberal in the UK, but even more liberal. <laughs> and there's a, there's a cryptic crossword on The Guardian that is literally renowned. To be, he used to finish the cryptic crossword in like eight minutes. He was so smart. So whenever I used to commit my code into, into the thing, we didn't have, call it branching in those days in the same way as we, we'd work in our own spaces, we'd have our own commit, and then we'd merge, we'd move stuff, literally move files in, it was all those days. It was a disaster of epic proportions usually. So what I avoid it, our experience is that when you something horrible and painful, you avoid it. So, that, so when I say trunk-based development, that's an extreme maybe. 
But just, even if you're using branching, can try to keep that to a minimum. Commit as much as you possibly can. Bring things together. Now, I'm not the smartest guy at branching and trunk-based development. I haven't written code for a while. Well, other than a little bit of fun, a scaler and things like that. But what I would recommend is you look at the trunk-based, the work that's being done on trunk-based development. Don't believe the people at GitHub. Because if you've got a tool that's fabulous for doing branching and merging, what would you talk a lot about? Um, you know, if I've got a nail, I have an exam. Anyway, but, but, and just think about it. Don't necessarily adopt it, but do treat branches as a little bit dangerous. Because they always are. Because what happens is that everything's going brilliantly, you've all committed, and then Bob comes in and says, and you say, oh, well, hey, I noticed that your, um, your ticket issue, whatever you call it, story, isn't in. Oh, yeah, I'll commit it in. Sorry, mate, I've been working. I got sidetracked. Bring it in. Everything collapses. And that always happens when? Last day of the sprint, just before you release. I mean, it always does. And you're like, what did you do? <laughs> and it doesn't solve that problem. Of, you still have to pull it out <laughs> at some point. Yeah, but at least now it's just one. You just didn't want to commit. Our experience is if you're doing continue, if you think in the I mentality, it's better to do it more frequently. If you're in the mentality, then because at any one moment, unless you're very unlucky, only one person's committing it. I mean, and then if you're continue when you and you, if you automate the hell out of it, so you do integration, so you commit back into a, into a main branch, you then do integration on that, so it's all compiled and integrated depending on your programming. Might not even be integrated nowadays, but anyway, it all just works together. You then run a series of tests, all well, those integration tests, smoke tests, whatever you want to call it. Then, soon as somebody commits and it goes wrong, then suddenly, <laughs> so now you're much earlier in the sprint, and you're suddenly like really aware of it. So you do one or two things: you hopefully fix it, beat the person a bit, and then. <laughs> But you, it all get, it's all about transparency, mate. You know, I'm trying to raise a transparency. Developers have a propensity, a desire, and, and I was one of these, to sit and do and polish my apples and, and, and get into this world of abstraction and get into that zone that we love, that nobody can understand unless maybe, maybe uh, musicians can, maybe writers can, my wife can't. Uh, and you go into this world that's just like this model in your head, and you're like, Ooh. and what do you want to do? You want to add more to it. The last thing I want to do is deal with integration issues. So it's like homework. I push it and push it and push it. My branch gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I commit it because I have to. And then <laughs> I suddenly get ill, man cold, deadly. And uh, I'm out. <laughs> And it's awful. And you, if you're the lead engineer, are like, <laughs> Jesus, what's Bob done? Anyway, that's anyway. I, I'm sure. I Google it, look at it, get into it, learn it, become an advocate for it. And I, I, I yeah. Conceptually, you're like, how? But it does work. Anyway, sorry. So, let's get the online question. Oh, sorry. Are there any online questions? Is there anybody online? It's, been, it's my mum, isn't it? She's always online. <laughs> So, okay, is there any questions online? Uh, we don't have any questions online right now. Okay. Okay. All right. My mom's not learned how to use the question thing. So we are all set now. You can actually, if you want, stop or you do anything you want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm available for another 30 minutes, and I turn into a puppet. Yeah. Well, <laughs> let me uh, let me take just a moment to uh, thank you, Dave, for your presentation, um, and to let everybody know that if they'd like to have Dave to visit their chapter or to have one of our other DVPs, uh, distinguished visitors, to uh, join their chapter. They need to go to computer.org slash web slash chapters slash DVP. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Bodish for hosting this. Um, and I'd like to invite everybody to join us again on December 14th at 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, US, um, for Generalize or Die. Operating System Support for Memristor-Based Accelerators. That will be given by Dan Miloyich. Um, he's the senior... <laughs> Pardon? I was going to say, that's a real presentation. None of this wobbly <laughs> process malarkey, is it?
He is the senior researcher and managing director of the Open Cirrus Cloud Computing Testbed at HP Labs. He's also the professor of cloud management at San Jose University. And right now he serves as the IEEE Division 8 director. Prior to that, he was the IEEE Computer Society president in 2014. So join us on the 14th. Um, and again, thank you, everybody. And I'm signing off. Thanks.